We are here at Fully Charged Live and we have taken the opportunity to do something a little bit close to my heart. For those of you who don't know, I am an ER nurse in my other job where I wear my other hat and a slightly different set of clothing. And I have been excited to see the first 911 responding Mac E in Canada. And we're here with Jose Font to talk about how they've done that and what changes they've made and how it's working having an electric vehicle responding to 911 calls. Thank you so much for joining us, Jose. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do? Thank you. It's my pleasure to uh, be in this interview. Uh, I'm a senior business analyst with the BC Ambulance Service, and uh, I've been leading the initiative to get green vehicles for our fleet. Um, the Mach-E is the first primary response unit which has been operated by advanced care paramedics. And we're finding that um, at the end of their shifts, they're more relaxed, um, they're less fatigued, um, their response time is much better, and we've been able to integrate uh, several features into the car, which is unique to electric vehicles. I think one of the things that perhaps our viewers in the United States may not know is that you have a variety of different response vehicles. In the United States, it's not uncommon for a fire truck to be the vehicle that responds to an medical emergency. Can you give us an idea of what kinds of different vehicles you have and how you use those? Uh, well, first of all, we are a pan-provincial service, uh, public sector organization. So we service the whole province. We have uh, just over 650 ambulances and they're primary care ambulances, uh, advanced care ambulances, and also critical care ambulances. And then coupled with that, we have 250 SUVs and they serve in the role of primary care paramedics, uh, advanced care paramedics, and supervisors. Uh, the fire department does go to some calls to assist but uh, they do not have the training that the ambulance service has. Um, so they will assist and sometimes they get on scene uh, initial and, and, and they'll help with the preparation of the patient. Um, but then our paramedics arrive and then take over. And I noticed that while we've been in Vancouver, we've also seen paramedics out on bicycles. Um, we have bike squads and we have them in downtown Vancouver where the streets are narrow, there's a lot of alleys and laneways and so they're fast to respond to a local call. We also have them at uh, Vancouver Airport, and so they're able to respond within the airport on their bikes. Um, and then, of course, we also have uh, amb uh, air ambulance, where we have helicopters and uh, fixed-wing aircraft. So you mentioned before the different people who might arrive at the scene when someone calls with a medical emergency and the different vehicles they might arrive with. And a lot of people who aren't medical might think, well, I've called an ambulance, I need to go to hospital. How can someone who turns up on a bike or in a vehicle help in that kind of a situation? Well, you're right that we have uh, different response vehicles uh, and modes. And um, the most important thing is to get the right resource at the right time um, to the right event. And so um, uh, a low acuity call will send a low acuity response unit where um, the patient will probably not need to be transported to the hospital. Uh, a lot of times they won't even need to leave their home. Um, or they might go to a local health clinic. Um, in the case of this vehicle, for example, they will go to the highest acuity calls. So in our dispatch center, they will triage the call and send the appropriate resource. And what kind of treatments can someone arriving in a vehicle like this perform? Uh, this, uh, an advanced care paramedic, they'll have higher level of training um, than a primary care paramedic and so they'll be able to do intubations, um, administer uh, controlled and targeted substances, narcotics, um, which are highly controlled in Canada and so you have to have a certain uh, uh, paramedic level to be able to administer them. And tell us a little bit about what you've seen using an electric vehicle because you are the first in Canada if I'm correct. For, for 911 response? Yes. Um, it, it's twofold. One is because we are a provincial organization, we are committed to reducing our carbon emissions 40% by 2030, and the bulk of our carbon emissions are our fleet. Um, and then secondary, um, but no less important, are also the health benefits of not having uh, uh, exhaust emission. Um, and then the third is financial. 
is that um, the payback is typically two years uh, with an electric vehicle. And you mentioned before that you've made some changes to this vehicle. What kinds of things have you done to make this ideally suited for the role that it's filling? Well, we've uh, isolated the uh, auxiliary systems and we have auxiliary batteries, which are independent completely of the car's uh, battery system. And so uh, when we arrive on scene, uh, the car can be turned off, but we can have the lights on still. Uh, we can access the uh, uh, dispatch computer, uh, the uh, uh, electronic patient care record. So anything electronic that is unique to our service uh, we have it running off of the auxiliary batteries. And the auxiliary batteries enable us uh, to run uh, yeah, over 12 hours without having to worry about uh, the charge. And you mentioned being able to access electronic care records. I don't see a separate tablet or computer inside there as I've seen in other ambulances. Yeah, th that is unique that we've been able to use the car's uh, 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 center display screen and integrate our dispatch software. And so that also integrates with the navigation system of the car. So it's a very seamless operation and a paramedic can go to a call with less cognitive load of worrying about how to get to the call. For those who don't know, I am an emergency nurse. I work in an ER. I don't have to go into people's houses, which is a whole different thing. I've been out with EMS before and it is a very different world. But Having some of that cognitive load taken away can free up a little bit of extra capacity in someone. And you mentioned before that the crews have found them more relaxed at the end of the shift. Has their response been generally positive or have they been concerned about range or anything like that? Um, typically people that aren't familiar with uh, uh, EVs today um, will have some concerns because they're not knowledgeable. Um, but after the, uh, they've used the vehicle for several shifts, then they realize that there's no issues. Um, we've looked after the charging infrastructure so that at the stations there's chargers and then also at um, hospital emergency uh, uh, ambulance bays also have chargers as well. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to you at home for watching. Teleprompter is still flat, but you know, we're here at Fully Charged Live, so we're trying to take the most opportunity to get and see all the things here. So it's the phone. And on that note, we are done with today's video. If you have comments, drop us a polite note in the Discord chat room on Mastodon, or if you're a Patreon supporter, you can drop your note in the comments there. If you want more, subscribe, hit the bell, and follow the links below to regularly support us with a YouTube membership or Patreon subscription. You'll also find links to our Kofi, Bitcoin and Swag store, as well as that aforementioned Mastodon server. Scrolling by on my right is our amazing list of charged up supporters and shout outs go to our V to G supporters, Alan Tupper, Andrew Martin, Bennett Elder, Brophy Wolf, Chris Maxwell, Cyprian Laplace, Dan Blair, Gordon C. Hey Esker, John Trammell, Kyle Fox, Mark Eggleton, Peter Dillinger, Raging Fellows, Sean Tucker, Stefan Fremgen, Stephen Williams, okay. Tesla in the Gong, Paul Bricknell, Tony Moss, Kyle Hodgson, Chris Center, Denny Hyde, Lance Schall, Linda Irish, Mike Weeder, Paul Nelson, and finally, big thanks to our off-grid supporters, Paul Conway, Kevin Boroughbridge, Stephen O'Donoghue, Jim Burness, Robert Flannery, Aaron Hahn, Ellery Hensley, Rory Litwin, JP Fagerback, Dave Kitchen, Andrew Glenn, Anonymous Freak, Chris and Michael Johnson, CPU Freak 101, Eric Knack, Joe Bresney, John Henderson, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Drobnak, Nigel S, Reggie Watts, Will Graylin, and of course, Ian. Don't forget we make videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday on the main channel, plus Sunday on take two. And with that, I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you soon, and as always, Keep evolving. Bye.